Uh, before I start, has anyone been to, this is my third talk today, has anyone made all three? Any hands? No? Just two? This is the third. You made all three? Okay. This is your second. Okay, we'll see. Maybe the, I've got some after party tickets to give away, so uh, maybe by the end I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, a worthy challenge for someone. Okay. What's on deck today? Uh, hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, hi, guys. It's my third talk today, and uh, pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, if somebody could get a picture and tweet me uh, with me up here in front of this backdrop, that'd be pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the, so what we're going to talk about today is IMSI catchers, and if you're not familiar with those, I'll go through it, uh, and how you might go about detecting them. Uh, you're going to hear an exciting tale of my adventures in Vegas looking for them. And uh, you're going to learn how to avoid being caught up in an IMSI catcher. Uh, so hopefully this is, you're in the right talk and that's where you want to be. So I'm Jeff. I'm a security engineer with Security Innovation. Uh, we do AppSec pen testing and advisory to pretty much any area of the SDLC. We help people build secure software. That's really my goal. Um, I used to be a high school prison teacher, or high school and or prison teacher, and university teacher. Um, and uh, I work 100% from home, so it was a big stretch to come all the way from Toronto to here to, to be with you today. So uh, thank you for joining me as well. So uh, I'm going to go through some definitions and just sort of explain the technologies a bit. Uh, I'm not going super deep on the technical level, but uh, I'll just give you an overview so you can understand what's going on, and then we'll uh, get into some of the work I've done. So an IMSI catcher, uh, when you hear IMSI catcher, think uh, any rogue cellular device uh, designed to capture phone uh, traffic, often used by police or governments, and the most popular brand is Stingray, uh, which is uh, sold to police and governments by the Harris Corporation. And uh, the IMSI is your international mobile subscriber identity. It's unique to your cell phone. You actually have two. You have one for your cell phone and one for your SIM card. Uh, they can rotate. Um, but it's, it's what defines you on the cellular network. Uh, then the carriers will look that up to your subscriber information to get uh, your cell phone number, your address, stuff like that. Uh, and one thing that's really interesting around these is the vendors impose very strict NDAs around disclosure of how they're used or what their capabilities are. So you can't actually, even the police in governments and, and uh, in uh, warrant cases where they're submitting warrants to the courts, can't describe in too much detail what these technologies do as part of the, or they'll be in breach of the NDA. Um, so they, they keep them pretty tight-lipped in terms of their capabilities. There's plenty of room down front. Um, so this is what they look like. Uh, the one on the top left there is the, the Harris Stingray. And uh, they can come in different forms. You can see them in big uh, police vehicles with antennas coming up them. Or you could, I'm convinced uh, you could probably get them down to the size of a cell phone with a little bit of a work. Or you could just... Um, a uh, little work with your antenna drivers and or maybe a secondary antenna with your cell phone and you might be able to just build it into the cell phone in the future. Uh, the one in the top right, I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's basically a DIY kit that you can make your own, uh, reasonably inexpensive. Uh, this is the specifications of them. Uh, if you see in the last image, in the top left there, there's the four antenna jacks. Uh, that's for four different antennas that you can hook up. So you, they are capable of intercepting and monitoring 2G, 3G, 4G, or LTE uh, communication simultaneously in both CDMA and GSM. Those are just the different types of networks that uh, your cell phone might be on, depending on your carrier and the, the antennas in it. Uh, the devices can launch attacks requesting devices to connect over weaker channels. So. Uh, they can jam the 4G or 3G networks, forcing you to go into the 2G network, which is of lower security and no encryption, which would then mean they could uh, intercept all of your traffic and read your text messages and stuff like that. Uh, even with the 3G, it's uh, reasonable to assume that they, they are capable of doing that as well. 
there's two modes for uh, NIMSY catcher, active and passive. In passive mode, it's simply just grabbing information out of the air, uh, whatever it sees. In active mode, it's actively proxying your traffic and it's doing its best to convince cellular devices to connect to that rogue device and then proxy it on to an, a legitimate device, but in the middle, basically does a man in the middle attack and intercepts all of the traffic. These are some proven uh, stories of how they've been used. Uh, these, some of these range from mundane to quite scary. Uh, this is all sourced and there's additional information on all of the sources uh, by a report written by Citizen Lab out of Toronto when we think about uh, cyber warfare and nation state actors and human rights, uh, the Citizen Lab is a research center focused on um, protecting civil liberties. So confirming the presence of a device in a target's home prior to the search thereof. So let's say you had a search warrant for a house and you wanted to make, and you knew that a assailant or drug dealer or whatever was using the cell phone for their business. Uh, and you wanted to make sure the cell phone was in the house before you searched the house. Uh, they have confirmed cases of that. Uh, identifying an individual responsible for sending harassing text messages. It's been uh, used and documented in that case as well. So all of these, there are court documents that support these uh, in the report. Locating a stolen mobile device as a precursor to searching a home in the vicinity. Uh, I don't know the whole backstory on that, but basically saying, hey, there's a stolen device in there in that house, we're gonna go search the house now. Uh, now, locating specific individuals by driving around a city until that known IMSI number is found. So you could pretty much just uh, dragnet and pick up every IMSI number until you see the one needle in the haystack you find, and they, there are cases of them doing that. They are mounted on airplanes uh, by the United States Marshal Service to sweep entire cities for specific mobile devices. So now you can see where everyone is all at once if you don't already have access to the cellular providers. Um, to monitor all devices within range of a prison to determine whether or not prisoners are using cell phones that have smuggled in. Uh, some of these you know, get very uh, interesting at least, or some I would say scary. Uh, reportedly, they've been used at political protests to identify everyone participating in a protest. That's, uh, so you bring your cell phone to a protest, uh, they're gonna know and they're gonna follow up with you later. Uh, to monitor activity in offices of an independent Irish police oversight body, I don't know the full backstory on that, but uh, when you're using it against other governing bodies, that's uh, pretty interesting as well. So again, all the sources are there, you're welcome to look it up. Uh, uh, these are two other cases, uh, so we're talking about how much are they used. There were 1,400 confirmed cases in Baltimore alone. Uh, this came out in the last year, and actually just, just uh, last month or this month. And uh, they were predominantly used in black neighborhoods, so they took that 1,400, those 1,400 cases and heat mapped them around uh, areas and then geographically around demographic and we're able to find that those were in predominantly uh, black neighborhoods, suggesting they were overused against various races. And then thousands of times in Florida since 2007 for crimes as small as someone hanging up on a 911 operator, dialing 911 and hanging up, and then they would go around with the Simsy catcher. So they are wild, widely used, in use. Uh, it's hard to find documentation about it because they come out years later in court documents and through freedom of information requests. So you don't always know a lot. Uh, I know that the RCMP in Canada are using them as well as other European nations, but I haven't seen any. You prob you've probably heard more of specific cases than I have in the, in the EU. The manual for how to, how to use one of these things was leaked uh, this summer. So that's an interesting read uh, if you wanna have a look at that. I, I have, it, it, talks, it goes into depth about the capabilities, how they're used, they're, there is a, what, what features and options are available in different models. Now this is a relatively old document, but uh, it only finally came out now. Where to buy one? Uh, unfortunately, they're only sold to government police and military uh, with those strict NDAs and high level service contracts. I can only imagine how much they're paying for them. But for $1,400, you can build your own. There's the link. I'm not telling you to go build your own. You're probably illegal. 
uh, in most areas uh, because you don't have the rights to broadcast at that frequency. Um, I don't know where the gray areas are around uh, just observing that frequency. That might be a different case. So uh, in terms of strategies to find one of these devices, there aren't really any good detection methods. Um, they're entirely anomaly based. And what that means is you have to basically walk your entire neighborhood and make note of all cell phone towers and IDs and fi uh, you find and their location. So you walk around and you identify everyone you can. And you continue to do this for a while until you're sure you found all of them. And then uh, you have to continuously monitor your area to see if any new ones pop up. And when those new ones pops up, you suspect it's an IMSI device. Uh, so you go and find it, and then you can go, and ta-da, you found it. Uh, what do you win? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so there's some tools to help you out. Uh, there's Open Cell ID, which is uh, interesting. It's a database of mostly user-reported cellular, cellular data, their devices, and uh, the location identifiers. Problem with this is if I was a large government and wanted to publish uh, wanted to place an IMSI catcher in a particular location permanently, I would just send that data to OpenCell ID as well, and then it becomes uh, part of the set. So you have no, there's no real verification on this. Um, AIS, so Android IMSI catcher detector app, is the tool that I used in this work, and uh, it's basically every tower device you connect to, it logs it, and then you can map it and analyze it and you can compare it against the open cell ID data, which is what I did. It does require a rooted device, so you probably wouldn't use it on your regular everyday device, which makes it harder for you to de detect them because you'd always have to carry two phones with you. Uh, and then at the same time, when I was in Vegas this summer at DEF CON, I was walking around looking for MZ catchers. Uh, Eric Escobar was presenting on a, on a device he built for $50 where you can better triangulate devices. And he presented this year the white papers there, and I haven't seen the video yet, but it's, it's available to you as well. Uh, or sorry, yes. Uh, so that's for $50. My guess is his is probably much better at finding the exact location than a mobile device. Uh, so I, I'm still to build a couple of those. All right, so it's story time. Uh, just by show of hands, anybody not familiar with Black Hat or DEF CON? I guess it's okay if you want, don't want to admit it. Uh, um, any, anybody been? Was anybody there this year? Okay, so uh, I'm going to go on to do something that you don't have, you know, first-hand experience about the conference or anything like that. So uh, first thing you need to know is that before you go to DEF CON or Black Hat, everyone warns you about how dangerous the networks are in, in Las Vegas during Black Hat or DEF CON. Now, accounts range depending on who you talk to from a hostile network to the most hostile network on earth. Now, I'm a, I'm a hacker, and when I hear the most hostile network on earth, I think, hmm, can I think of any more hostile networks? So I, I tried to think about some, and uh, I thought, well, I'm sure there's some countries where tweeting views in opposition to the ruling re regime is probably pretty dangerous. It might get you a visit or... Uh, interrogation or any sort of prison or anything like that. So that seems like it would be a pretty hostile environment to tweet in or anything like that. And then I remembered the Arab Spring where uh, people were holding out their phones and getting shot at by snipers while trying to take pictures of police brutality. So those seem like pretty hostile networks to me. Uh, how does DEF CON compare to those during the week <laughs> in Vegas? Uh, that's what I wanted to find out. Uh, so. Instead of uh, taking a broad approach, I decided to narrow solely on uh, wireless. You know, I didn't want to focus on everybody. Everybody knows, yeah, you don't use, sure, you don't use the hotel wireless, but uh, what about the cellular networks or what about other networks? So I decided to focus on the GSM cellular network because uh, that's the type of phone I had was a GSM cell phone. So before I get too deep into the work I did, I need to go on a bit of a rant. <laughs> Bear with me. I, Please, uh, personally, I pride myself on someone who cares deeply about the security and privacy of regular people. Uh, one of my core values is to help people be safe online and in their daily activities, and one of my talks earlier today was actually on the same subject. Uh, 
So I feel that as a hacker or security professional, it is my job or duty to educate and share our knowledge with uh, the broader pub public. All that said, what are we doing to help the people who just happen to come to Vegas during Black Hat or DEF CON? Uh, are they to be unknowingly swept up in the mass dragnet of uh, surveillance and exploitation that occurs at this conference? Many of us, uh, like personally, I took uh, measures to protect myself, but people who are just uh, on their vacation probably didn't take those same measures. And uh, that, uh, and I just, I think of the couple who just goes on the vacation to get away from their kids for a week, and they, you know, they do things like use the ATM or uh, connect to the hotel wire wireless to book a show ticket or something like that. Should their like entire bank account be compromised because of that? Uh, I, I usually, I, I feel pretty bad about that. And um, whether or not that is the case uh, is, is debatable, but I often found myself striking up conversations with people around the casino and bars or elevators who were in town, but not for the conference. You know, we'd talk and uh, I'm, I'm a pretty friendly guy. I've talked to most people. So uh, the conversation would lead to things like why they were in Vegas and why I was in Vegas, and then I'd have to tell them why I was in Vegas, and that I was a hacker, and that would usually elicit some sort of response around fear, and oh my god, or, am I safe? I was like, well, I probably wouldn't use, I would probably say something to the extent of, a, I maybe wouldn't recommend using the hotel wireless this week, because there's 40,000 of us in town, and uh, it's probably, probably not the safest thing, uh, just because people like to hack stuff. Uh, and then I'd maybe give them advice on how to better secure their devices, things like two-factor authentication, and other, maybe use the cellular networks or LTE while they're here. But it still made me feel pretty crappy. Like, I didn't feel good about it. And I witnessed other people do the same thing, maybe with a little less finesse than me, and it was more of a fear-mongering. I don't, I don't really like that. So I think, uh, as an industry, uh, we need to think about the rhetoric or message we're sending. I would much rather go to a conference and be able to tell people, yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, you, you could, while you're in Vegas, use the hacker net because it's the safest one in the world uh, and your, your data will be safe. I, I, I realize I might not get to that point, but uh, I wish that would, would be the case or we could aspire to less than the most hostile network on earth. Uh, that would be a good first step, I think. Okay, so end of rant, and let's move on with the show. Uh, so before DEF CON, I had this vision in my mind and uh, of how this work would go. I had this idea that I would take my cell phone, I'd walk around Las Vegas until I identified this rogue cellular device, this, this IMSI catcher. I was like, aha, I'm going to find you. And then I would, uh, in my mind, the conversation would go, I'd approach the person or individual, I'd say, hey, can I see what's in that backpack? I'm kind of curious. Or I'd, I'd walk up to a hotel room and I'd figure it out, I'd narrow it down, I'd knock on the door, and what would happen next would either be, uh, hey, that's really cool, let's see this. Here, yeah, I'm happy to show you all what I'm doing. Or um, it could, it could go completely the other way. It might be the best version of a game called Spot the Fed uh, at DEF CON if you're not familiar with it. Um, you have to consider that with that many hackers uh, in the area at one time, it creates a target-rich environment for uh, federal authorities to buy people drinks, to get them to slip, and, and talk about all the illegal activity they're doing. So a lot of federal authorities do attend in plain clothes. And you know some of them just come because they think it's cool too. And that's all right. Uh, so DEF CON has a game that if you can spot the Fed and you can prove that they're, they're working or trying to uh, get information out of you, you win a t-shirt, maybe a pitcher, and their, their reward is they get to go sweep, sweep the parking lot. Uh, so in my mind, that's, that's what I was trying to accomplish, was just to identify and tangibly say, this is an IMSI catcher. I, I wish they weren't using it. Uh, tell me about it. Um, so let's, uh, so that's the most hostile stuff I was talking about. Uh, that's my setup. Uh, I have the Android MZ, uh, MZ Catcher Detector app with my burner phone. Uh, next time it, it, it syncs with Open Cell ID, but before I left it wasn't quite working properly for me. So I, uh, I just analyzed the data afterwards. 
Uh, in future, I would have synced it better in advance. Uh, my company, the, the, for us at DEF CON, that's our big, uh, everybody gets together. We work all across North America, so it's our one chance to get together as a team. So we'd go out in the limo and go to dinner and everything like that. While doing that, I was collecting data of all the towers I was driving by. So that's uh, me war driving the strip in style. Uh, oh, that's spoiler alert. Um, so, some of the things I found that real-time analysis and exact location was pretty tough. Uh, so I decided to just collect the data and analyze it after. As I was walking around, I was like, this isn't making sense, it's not quite working, it's not getting the right data, so I'm just going to collect and analyze after. Uh, so here's what I found. So what I did was I walked Vegas beforehand, all the areas of the conference, collected all the tower data, and then after the conference, I looked at my data again from having going around. So here's what I found. Please don't freak out. So before the conference and after the conference, uh, there's a few more dots there. Don't freak out yet. So to the casual observer, this looks really bad. And at first glance, I would agree. I was concerned. I was like, what the heck? Was there that many IMSI catchers in Vegas while I was there? Like, this would confirm all of my thoughts. I knew that you know this, this isn't my main area of expertise. Uh, I, I do a lot of mobile app assessments and mobile reverse engineering, but not as much in the, in the cellular network uh, areas. So I knew that I needed to do a little more research. And as I analyzed the data, I started comparing the results to Open Cell ID, which is a user, again, the user data, database of discovered cellular devices. Uh, when I researched the Barris, the, sorry, the Barris Bali's area of Las Vegas, I found that in many cases there were multiple redundant devices, and this is to handle the load of a lot of people in a very small area. So what you would see is that you could have uh, multiple devices, might have three antennas with three unique IDs, and you would have caught all of them, just depending on what time you walked through. So you'd really have to walk through this dozens of times before you'd be sure you caught every device. And even still, there could have been someone multiple floors, so unless you're walking every floor, uh, there's potential of you missing a lot. Um, all right, so let's do the next one. So there could have been, lo so I, I acknowledge that there's probably lots of false positives in that data. There could have been multiple redundancy devices, and it, there could have been some GPS issues as well. Um, the GPS accuracy on mobile devices is something to be desired. If I had identified a road one, I probably could have got within 20 to 40 feet of it, but uh, any closer I think would have been a challenge for sure. I would have been just relying on if I could see any suspicious characters, which at DEF CON is everyone. Um, so I then excluded all devices that were reported to Open Cell ID, and this is uh, what's left. Uh, sorry, the red dots are on there. They're a little small. I didn't realize the TV was a small, but uh, those red dots uh, represent the devices that I did not see in my preliminary walk and were not already known to open cell ID. There's about 12 of them. So those are 12 devices. Are they all IMSI catchers? I don't know still. Um, so uh, one of the, it's possible that one of these is a uh, IMSI catcher, but I'm not sure. There was reports that someone was arrested for, for using an IMSI catcher while at DEF CON. Uh, that did circle around, whether it was rumor. I, I, I believe it to be true, but I haven't seen a confirmed police report or anything. Uh, so I don't know. It's possible. So, but the next one is a little peculiar. So before I was at uh, Paris, where I, was, where, where I was staying for DEF CON, the through, few days before, I had a nice vacation at Caesars and attended Black Hat a little bit. So I spent three nights in Caesars before DEF CON, and what was weird was lots of towers were picked up while I was sleeping. And it suggests a bit of a, a drive-by attack uh, or a flyover, but I wasn't sure. So I was also seeing a lot of things. My, my phone was jumping. It would alert me every time it changed networks, and it was alerting me all night. Uh, that it was changing networks between LTE and GSM or 3G or 2G, and it was picking up all these towers. So that looked uh, pretty peculiar. And um, when I removed the open cell ID ones, 
He left me with four. So at least four of these devices were not previously not known to open cell ID. And I did exclude a couple others, uh, but they were only, had only been seen once before, once or twice before. So there were four that had definitely never been seen before. And uh, this is where, with other devices, uh, other, there might be 30 or 40 reported sightings of a, a cellular device. So to not have seen one is, is just, it could be new, there could be other explanations. Uh, so that's it's possible. It's possible. And it suggests, given the concentration, that there was either somebody driving down the road or flying over the area while I was sleeping doing that. I, I can't confirm it, which, which sucks. So part of my research is, hey, I couldn't, I was actively looking for these devices and I couldn't easily find one. If you looked at your device right now, you wouldn't know if you were connected to one, like if I have one in my bag or anything. I don't, but uh, you wouldn't know. And, and that sucks. So, well, do you care? And uh, that really, that depends on uh, your personal threat model. If you care about a government knowing where you are, and we saw the reasons and how they're used, uh, if, they want, if they check to know if you're home, if they check to know where you've been, if you were in the neighborhood of a protest while it was going on, right? So, uh, solutions, don't use your device. Uh, sorry, <laughs> if you don't want to be caught up in this, don't use your device. Uh, and interesting, I was talking to a reporter about this issue and we, we were brainstorming some ideas on getting around it, but I, I'm convinced that if you did Wi-Fi calling over a VPN, you wouldn't be caught in the NIMSI catcher. And if you were in Vegas using uh, uh, DEF CON wireless, then you know, you'd run the risk of being caught on the network. But if you were doing a VPN, maybe you'd be a little bit better off. So, or if you were just in a normal situation, not at DEF CON, you could use the, you could use the VPN with uh, Wi-Fi calling and be of a reasonable assurance that you wouldn't be caught by one. Uh, if you're concerned, SMS is completely plain text messaging, so uh, I would recommend Signal, which is made by o Open Whisper. It's an app for end-to-end -end encryption uh, between people, and they were recently sued by the government, and they said, sorry, we don't have anything to give you. We don't keep any data. So they just uh, pretty good evidence that they have your back. Um, I think that if a wireless carrier published the tower IDs, you could at least know if an ID matched or not. Uh, it would take some work on their part, keeping that up to date. Uh, but then it would also lead to device spoofing and you'd, you'd just, uh, in, you would increase, the, you'd make all those stingrays obsolete, but then they'd have to go buy more uh, because they'd have to have a new feature with uh, the ability to detect or to spoof devices. And then I would, argue we should pressure wireless carriers to implement mutual authentication between devices. Currently you, you uh, authenticate, the, the tower authenticates the user is allowed to connect to the network, uh, but not the user is not authenticating that the tower is valid. Um, so that would be a big step forward in the protocols. Um, so if I had some conclusions, I would say that they're very hard to detect. This is what part of makes them so dangerous and you rarely know when you're connected to devices. Uh, I wish I could be more helpful to you. It's pretty, thank you. Uh, it's been a wonderful visit. Uh, thank you for the audience. Well, uh, thank you. And uh, I've got to say that uh, this ranks as the creepiest presentation that I've heard here. Thanks. I don't know, there may have been <laughs> That's what I was going here. for. <laughs> yeah, there, there may have been others. Um, are there any questions? Turn off all your devices and then ask. Um, did anybody, yes. just a yes. second though, uh, some more people came in. Has anybody been to all three of my talks today? No, the other two are pretty full. You've been to two, all right. All right, yes, I will give you the mic because all of this is being streamed. And... Uh, can you make a Stingray replica device by having a full duplex separation of USRP board? And, uh, Sorry? If, uh, if, if you have a full duplex separation of USRP board, like N600, uh, which has a full duplex, can you make a Stingray replica? Yeah, the uh, demo I showed you uses, you can buy your own for 1400 I think you can probably get that down to 500 with the, 
uh, is it the hack RF or the blade RF? One's full duplex, one's half duplex. It's just USRP board that they have. Full yeah, duplex. any full duplex uh, mm -hmm. RF uh, generator will do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this one uses, I think, either the blade or the hack RF, or maybe, I think you could probably get it down to about $500. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm convinced with maybe very specific antennas and very specific uh, devices, you can probably get them a little cheaper. Mm -hmm. So yes, is, is your answer. That's, that's how they did it with this demo. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Okay. Well, that was uh, a slightly creepy question person there. But <laughs> the other one, let me see. <laughs> okay, uh, any more questions from the audience? No, nobody is scared of this. Nobody else is a journalist who might be being followed by three or four of our country's many security agencies who are basically spend most of the time chasing each other's tails. But uh, so, I don't know. I, I even don't have a question. I'm I'm uh, I just know now when not to go to Vegas. So not that I go there very often, but. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, get your your um, presentation and look in some of these some of these links. Um, but these MC devices are used mainly by by uh, by security forces, uh, police, and, and and intelligence agencies. Yeah, it's predominantly a government agency or entity that's using and, them. And the 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 ones that the ones that. Uh, our possibly engineer friend there may be building now, in her, in that her being garage. Said, <laughs> that being said, uh, there's known documentation of, uh, for instance, Mexican drug lords deploying their own cellular networks or other areas of the world that people will deploy their own networks because it's, it's better or more efficient or more secure than, uh, than the, the, one, the what, state What about uh, uh, private eyes, private detectives who you know, get hired to find out, you know, somebody's partner or spouse or something is up to something. So the FCC in the States is challenging this, uh, or the, sorry, the EFF is challenging this in the States with the FCC, saying uh, we can't uh, petition Congress to say you can't use these devices because it's not getting anywhere, but let's go through the FCC and say you don't have the legal right to broadcast on that bandwidth and you don't have the... Uh, licensing to broadcast, so you're violating the law in that regard, uh, and they're trying to tackle it from a frequency use uh, perspective. So these devices have to broadcast in order yes, to be effective. They, yeah, uh, so they're not, not they're just passive. Well, I said there was passive and active. Yeah. Uh, the active ones are certainly more dangerous. Uh, the passive ones would pretty much just collect your SMS over an insecure channel or break the crypto. Uh, the three. Can they locate you? And they can locate you, well, yes. Well, I mean, that's where, as I and said, a private, can, um, private detective bureau. And they can catch your IMSI value, which would allow, mm -hmm. would allow you to look them for, would allow them to look you up uh, in terms of your phone number, your address, and billing information. So what are the possible, I mean, you know, you can, you can even look at the legality of security agencies, intelligence agencies following you around uh, uh, in, in different ways. But what are the, the possible private and unsanctioned or illegal uses of these, these gadgets? Take your pick. Uh, if you can get in, so just last week, there was a report that came out on somebody who was uh, deploying their own base stations uh, over the LTE network, and then they were launching attacks over LTE to people who connected to it or to the devices that connected to it. So then you're thinking about uh, how does your device, your device was certainly designed to handle uh, text messages and other types of data, but what happens if you start sending malformed packets or you start fuzzing it, then you look at areas where you could potentially remotely exploit the devices or send fake uh, text messages or anything like that. Send phishing links right to anybody, in the, anybody walks by in the area, connects to that network, and then you send them uh, phishing text messages, right? And get them to click and then further exploit them from there. Okay. Um, so you can get your fourth bag here. <laughs> yeah, it gets me more. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question in the back. I will bring you the, f the, the, the microphone so that you, you will be recorded and made. Yeah. Actually, I'm so, uh, somehow missed it. Uh, how can I detect by which tower my phone is operated? Yeah, how to find uh, and detect MZ catchers. Uh, like, you you uh, wouldn't I, know if your phone was connected to it right now. 
If you have an app, you could know what tower you were connected uh, so to. So there's an app for that. So I can I can like know I, I've been operated by a tower here or there. Yeah, you would. Uh, there's 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 a couple other apps in this space as well. The one I use, I mentioned, but uh, you can download this app and it'll tell you which device you're connected to. If you don't trust that particular tower, you yeah. can blacklist it. And then you're choosing to blacklist that tower and you'll connect to another tower instead. But I mean, you, you can't see the, where, the location of the tower. Well, you have a general idea based on signal strength and your GPS location. Yeah. And then if you wanted to walk around further, you could trilaterate it by uh, finding, by going to different points, taking measurements and Yeah, that's, it down. that's what you said. If you, if you see there's no tower, so you, you can go and explore and see if there's Yeah, any. so when I say towers, in you know, rural areas, there are definitely towers, but in areas like this, they're no bigger than a home router, yeah. right? Uh, with additional antennas on it. So you might see, I didn't check, I could pull up my app, uh, we could see how many we could find in the building uh, with, with some reason. I'm sure there's more than a couple. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to clarify, what the, the, the app that, that allows you to uh, detect what tower you're on doesn't tell you whether that's a good tower or nope. a bad tower. No, it doesn't. So, it doesn't. so is there an app to find the dark towers? No, the only way is to have some sort of anomaly-based detection where you know all the good ones in your area, and then when a new one pops up, you get suspicious. It's the only way right now. Okay, if it's not announced by one of the operators, the operators here used to often, you know, celebrate every 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 tower out in the middle of Podunk, <laughs> nowhere, Latvia, you know, with a, with a press release. So, um, okay, any more questions? This is interesting. This affects all of us who have phones in our pockets and are being followed by evil forces. So, oh, okay. There's okay. one more at the back. Ah, right. Okay, I'll have to give you the mic. And I have to... Uh... You guys are grilling me today. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, question about uh, locating those uh, stingrays or false towers. Actually, uh, you can put uh, those towers on the map only based on signal strength from one device and your own uh, coordinates. Right. So uh, seeing... Uh, uh, distributed dots on the map uh, means that there were there was uh, kind of uh, several uh, signals with several strengths. Yes. Um, so that's the other thing that was questionable around the Caesar's Tower data I showed you is at night uh, Vegas goes to sleep eventually, uh, maybe by four or five in the morning, and the uh, usage of cellular towers goes down and potentially like the, the noise in the area goes down, which means you might see a tower from further away that you wouldn't see during the day. Um, so actually, uh, developers of the application could improve that uh, to triangulate. Yes, such so uh, you could do it manually currently, uh, or you could improve on the app to better focus and triangulate with it. Okay, thanks. Feature request, uh, you're welcome to code it. Yeah, feature request. <laughs> That's a good question too, yeah. Okay, any, anyone else with uh, a question? You can earn yourself. I think he's been given a pile of these after party things so you can earn yourself an after party invitation if you, well. Okay, I think then we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> I'm supposed to give you this even had one brought up here because there is one in there, yes.